So welcome to Career Panel Linguists in Naming. I am the host for today. My name is Laurel Sutton. I am a namer. Uh, I have been working for my own company, Catchword, for 20 plus years now. And I am delighted to welcome this panel of namers today. So we have uh, Will Laban, who is from Stanford and has worked at Lexicon for many years. We have Eric Jackson, who uh, also worked at Lexicon and is now at Salt Branding. And our support, support person is Marcus Robinson. You can see him up there and he's also helping us in chat. So for today's topic, as I always like to say, it's true, developing brand names is a actual real job. And it's one for <laughs> which linguists are really well suited. So in today's panel, we're gonna talk about career journeys, how we all use our linguistic training at work and discuss opportunities available in naming and branding for people who want to take this on as a career. So to get started, I, people seem super interested in everybody's career journeys. So I would love for you guys uh, to talk about how you went from being a linguist in academia to actually going outside of it and finding this career in naming and maybe talk a little bit about um, your first job uh, outside of academia that is and how you came to it. So Eric, why don't you go first? Sure, sure. My um... So yeah, it's it's first. It's it's great to be here with you all, and it's an honor to be uh, invited as a panelist, sitting alongside some serious heavy hitters uh, in linguistics. Um, <laughs> and it is really such a small world. It's funny to see that um, actually my first job out, outside of academia was with Will, our fellow uh, panelist here. So <laughs> I went to Boston College. Um, I was doing my master's in linguistics, and. Uh, then from there, I got really interested in just the world of advertising and business and where those two sort of things intersect, language and, and marketing. Um, and I found my way to the, the niche world of brand naming as a, as a study and practice and um, encountered lots of research in my final uh, semesters um, in my master's program that were actually conducted and presented by Will Laban and, uh, and other team members at uh, Lexicon Branding, one of the just most phenomenal agencies out there um, when it comes to brand naming. I mean, they one of the first, you know, they're, they're, they're the big name in brand naming agencies specifically. So, um, and it was actually at a, an LSA, I think it was LSA 2015 conference in Portland where I met Laurel and oh. I met uh, another team member at Lexicon who gave a, a similar presentation about careers outside of academia uh, in linguistics. It was uh, Greg Alger, uh, a good friend and mm -hmm. former colleague at Lexicon. He um, gave a presentation about Lexicon and the work that they do um, when it comes to linguistics and brand naming and uh, we chatted after the conference and then looking around at jobs that's that's they had an opening and and it happened to fit and and it was great it was i was there for uh three years i think and started as a as a linguistics intern um doing research with will and a couple other interns <laughs> and that was a that was a really fun summer and then stayed on as uh transitioned more into the creative side of the of the business and was sort of one of those hybrid linguist creatives that you see uh, in, in brand naming agencies. And so that's sort of where I started. Um, and it was, it was a wonderful experience at, at Lexicon and just learning a ton. Um, we'll probably get into this a bit later, but just like the, <laughs> the difference between how we sort of think about linguistics and language in, you know, the university and academia, as opposed to, you know, how, how people in, in the marketing world think about language and, and how those skills sort of morph and transition and grow. And, um, but that, that was sort of my first uh, experience as an intern there at Lexicon and learning about what does it mean to even create a brand name? What is a, you know, what, there are agencies that do this <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, and it really was great. And it's an honor to, you know, be you know, a colleague of Will's now. It's, it's great to see you again, Will. And uh, yeah, that, that was sort of my first uh, foray into, into naming. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Will, you had, uh, I mean, you've been doing this for so long and you still have an academic academic affiliation. So can you talk about that a little bit? How did you get into naming? Yeah, uh, I, uh, uh, it was over 30 years ago that uh, someone from Lexicon stopped at my office and asked whether 
uh, I'd like to do some work for them. Uh, at the time, I was uh, a uh, professor at Stanford in the linguistics department, and uh, really wasn't uh, really wasn't prepared. Uh, wasn't wasn't even looking for uh, outside opportunities, but uh, this uh, I could tell uh, pretty much from the beginning that this was uh, this was going to be interesting and fun. And it's it's surprising now to look back over all those years and and uh, and see how how right that was. The, um, the uh, I uh, I don't think I, I need to talk about the problems of balancing an academic career with a career in industry because I think most uh, most of the people who are uh, attending here are interested in a full-time job in industry. And so in, in that sense, my experience may not be typical, but there are some things that I learned along the way that I'd like to pass along. Uh, um, uh, let me start with a, a couple of anecdotes. Uh, uh, the, um, when uh, uh, when Lexicon took me on as a consultant, one of the first things I did was I gave a few short lectures on what uh, what the uh, what linguistics could possibly have to offer to naming, and as a phonologist, I I uh, I focused on phonology, and I remember. At an early point in in my first lecture, I, I just uh, just talked about phonological analysis and phonological features, and uh, of course drew the, uh, 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 a big distinction between obstruents and sonorants because those sounds have such different impacts on people in names and and elsewhere, and, uh, and so I said, well. Uh, uh, among the sounds, we have obstruents or sonorants. A sound is either one or the other. And um, all vowels are sonorants, and, but not all sonorants are vowels. And at that point, the president of the company interrupted me and said, uh, someone write that down. <laughs> <laughs> and that, what that showed to me is uh, the... The, the level of knowledge of, of language in an organization that was devoted to creating names. So I, I knew from that instant that there was a role for me at Lexicon. And, and uh, what, it, what uh, the, uh, the, the broader lesson there is that in, in what we pick up, in, in linguistics, the things that are the most basic, the most everyday are, are uh, bits of information that are not generally known. And uh, uh, while that applies to phonology, it just applies to every domain of language, whether you're talking about attitudes towards correctness, if you're talking about how, uh, uh, talking about, I don't know, standards of politeness, dialects, uh, what, what, whatever it is, the, uh, the amount of knowledge that we acquire in our uh, training as linguists is uh, just vast compared to what even professionals uh, uh, know. And, uh, and, and it's good to keep that in mind. Uh, another thought that I have along those lines is that um, the the uh, my time as a graduate student was divided between learning material and figuring it out, developing analyses and theories of the material. And I have to say that uh, most of the knowledge of language that I've been able to apply successfully at Lexicon is 
is the the substantive stuff about uh, how languages can differ, the history of languages, how uh, people's different attitudes towards language, and the the uh, the the things that I spent the other half of my time on analysis analysis and theory. Those have played some role, but the uh, 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 but it's 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 an it's, it's an interesting kind of role. The um, uh, in, in phonology, we talk about underlying forms and surface forms, and none of that makes any sense to anybody outside of linguistics. But uh, but uh, theoretical concepts like uh, how how to make a sound argument, how to criticize an argument that's flawed, those uh, those kinds of talents that are, are skills that we get training in as linguists those kind of abstract reasoning skills are very, very useful. And then uh, um, what else? Uh, another, uh, another little anecdote, uh, shortly after uh, my, my lecture on phonology, uh, Lexicon had uh, developed, uh, had, it had a project for General Mills, but General Mills, which uh, makes Rice Krispies and Cheerios. They, uh, they came out with a new cereal in uh, around 1990 or so. I'm sure no one here uh, has ever heard of it, but uh, uh, Lexicon named it Triples. And uh, the, the reason for Triples was the cereal was it contained Rice Krispies. And then uh, that was one of the three ingredients, but also shaped like Rice Krispies, there were uh, things that were made out of wheat, and there were things that were made out of oats. So it was three different grades that entered into the, the things. It was, it, was, it was really nice. But at any rate, um, the president of Lexicon asked me what I thought of the name triples. And I said, well, what I really like about it is that it sounds crunchy. Mm. And he looked at me as if I had forgotten to comb my hair that day or something. It's just, <laughs> what? And so I, I, I explained. Uh, and and uh, that, that led to uh, uh, many years of research at Lexicon on the uses of sound symbolism. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, what, what I learned from, from that is that um, things, things that occur to us very naturally that just seems so obvious will be much less so to those who haven't had the opportunity to study sound systems in detail and just uh, ask, ask questions about what, what's the relationship between this sound and, and that sound. Yeah. And, uh, so again, what, what, uh, what, what, what uh, I, 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 this is going on and on. Uh, Laurel, you'll just have to stop me, but but <laughs> but but let me try to stop myself. Um, the um, uh, I think the, the value of our training in, uh, in 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 linguistics is we learn a, a pile of information about language that is very very relevant to uh, to naming and to other pursuits in in industry, we have no idea how, how valuable it is, but uh, we should just be, uh, it should, should have some, I think, I think just from, from talking to relatives, uh, you know, over Thanksgiving dinner, we, we get an impression that, yeah, there's, there's stuff there that we know that, that no one else is gonna be interested in. We can't really talk about it, but uh, the fact is to let, let that stuff out in 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 some way. Uh, 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 it it will be useful in the right context. But just have confidence that mm -hmm. there uh, that the uh, the the material that we have spent so much time acquiring is not is not just esoteric. It really has a utility to people, and you just have to find the right occasion to make use of it. Yeah. 
I, I couldn't agree more. I, I say this when people ask me about how I use linguistics in my job, and I use it every day all the time. And it's not just looking at names and analyzing their sound patterns or, you know, figuring out if they've got stop consonants, but it's also in the way that I communicate with clients. It's in the way I put presentations together. Um, it's how I communicate what I'm trying to communicate. And one of the, I wanted to ask you both, um, one of the things I really had to learn in moving from academia to industry was how to take those linguistic concepts that you're just talking about and express them in a way that people can actually understand them. People who don't have any linguistic training for whom these things are not obvious. So I often find myself doing a lot of um, parenthetical explanations. So if I'm saying to a client, this name doesn't have any uh, obstruents in it, and then I have to pause and go, an obstruent is, and then give some mm -hmm. examples so that they can understand it. And I have found, and, and Eric, you tell me if this is true, clients love that stuff, right? Like when you pull out these linguistic terms, as long as you can get them to understand what you're talking about, they feel like you're giving them some kind of secret information. Um, but you have to be careful not to slip into linguistics jargon mode or else they won't understand and then they feel like you're lecturing to them. Yeah. So um, what do you think, Eric? Did, have, did you have to learn how to do that too? <laughs> yes, absolutely. This was like the biggest transition from academia to just say any mo modern business situation, um, marketing, you know, the way you communicate your ideas as a linguist in academia, you sort of have like this deck of cards of like special terms and information and things that you sort of store away. And you can kind of flash these cards every once in a while with clients and, you know, using terms and concepts that you know, and you know that they apply. Um, you know, take one, for example, uh, I got really into the study of phone aesthetics, which is like a sub sec of phonetics or phonology, also called sound symbolism. It's the idea that there's sounds that convey non-arbitrary meaning. And that's that's kind of like up for debate in, in the linguistics world for sure, um, and how far that extends. But it's a really compelling idea when when you're when you're trying to sell something like a brand name that certain sounds have certain meanings. Um, and to give examples of how that's the case. And so you can kind of go, you know, you can go into the language, like sort of the science of that, um, but then you kind of have to, yeah, like you said, pull back a little bit ex and, and, and explain it in sort of um, everyday language about using examples of other brands or brand names or, or other words that, that sort of show whatever concept you're trying to uh, uh, express or, or convey and, yeah, there, there is, there is that sense of when you use your special knowledge of linguistics, um, it shows, it, it gives the, your clients a sense of trust and credibility that you, you know what you're talking about. Um, you are sort of like, you know, you're really a scientist, <laughs> and that that has a sense of authority to it. And so, um, but as any good scientist, you have to also. Um, be able to explain those concepts to people who may, you know, may not have the same background as you or the same training as you. And that's really the skills you develop, I think, in, in the business world is how to communicate that. Because the way I talked about language and, and words when I first started is way different than the way I talk now about it. And, um, you know, trying to be really sensitive to not just overwhelming someone with, um, you know, these lofty terms or very specific terms about things that we may be familiar with, but your average person just hasn't studied those things. So um, being being really aware, socially aware, really, of, of how how you're coming across, you want to be credible, you want to show, you know, the, there are certain con words and, and, and terms for certain concepts that are applicable, but also be able to explain them in sort of a casual, you know, colloquial way is, is a super important skill to learn. Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, Laurel, can I add, add something to what Eric sure. just said? Uh, uh, so I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, I, what, what, I'd, what I'd like to add is um, what, what that, uh, how what Eric just said can help people who are applying for jobs in industry. Uh, uh, the, if you, uh, any, anyone who is getting a, a, a PhD in linguistics nowadays, probably has to 
do some work as a TA somewhere along the line in their PhD program. And uh, what uh, one of the things that a TA experience gives you experience in is expressing complex ideas to a set of people who are not always 100% interested in what you have to say. And, and so make, making those ideas intelligible and relevant and fun. And uh, uh, in, uh, if, if you're a person looking for a job in industry, you can help your chances, I think, by, uh, by showing the relevance of your, uh, your graduate student teaching experience to working with the company and working with clients uh, in explaining, uh, in sorting out which linguistic concepts really are relevant and which ones you just too crazy to, to bother with, but also uh, just developing um, a sense of when people are following you, what will, uh, what will really make a difference to them. So for me, the trick is always to find a contrast, um, to find something where there's a difference that, that people can perceive, but they don't know where that difference is coming from. Mm -hmm. and like Laurel's example of obstruent versus, uh, versus non-obstruent, just something that explains a difference that every speaker of the language can feel but they don't understand where it's coming from. Something that, that like that says, wow, this person knows something that I don't know and it's relevant to me. Mm -hmm. But in job applications and in job interviews, it's really helpful to, uh, to be able to say, well, I have experience, uh, you know, I just don't do this esoteric stuff. I actually have experience in bringing this to the level of uh, people who need to understand it, but don't, you know, just uh, don't uh, don't know don't know what uh, what exactly to expect. So what Eric said, I think, is just very very helpful to keep in mind when you are applying for a job, writing a cover letter, or doing an interview and talking about your your special skills. Yeah, I agree. I, I think my uh, teaching experience when I was in grad school just is invaluable. That that place where you're having to explain these complicated concepts to people who might not really be grasping it. As you say, reading the room, figuring out where people are getting lost. Running For me, running a client meeting is like teaching. You're up in front of a group of people yes. and you're trying to sell them on whatever you're talking about. It's um, super helpful. Yeah. I, I wanted to, to pick up on, on something that uh, I have talked about in, in other places, but which you are all highlighting, and that's there's different parts of naming. I think this is interesting to people who don't know a lot about naming and marketing. So for example, in my company, um, there's a clear divide between the project management part and the creative part. And to be a namer, like I don't do a lot of creative work myself. I'm not a very creative person. I can't sit down and come up with a list of 500 names. But where my skills are is in the project management, communicating with clients and looking at that list of 500 names and being able to select the right names off of it, which I think is just a whole different skill. So naming is part art, right? The creativity, but it's also part science where you're bringing all those analytical skills to bear on what you're doing. Um, and so I'm interested to hear from you guys how you feel that plays in. I mean, what, what about you? How does your job break down? Gosh, yeah, everything you guys are saying is, is exactly the same experience the, the there's the creativity element of it, say a naming project. Um, typically, you know, ballpark would be maybe two months long of meetings and, and creativity. Of that two months, I'm, I probably spend I don't know, three days worth of, of work in those two months of actually creating and generating <laughs> lists of names. And the rest of that is really about um, evaluating, you know, choosing what what names are actually worth, <laughs> first of all, putting through trademark screening, which is another hurdle altogether. Um, and then, you know, how to how these names will because um, it really is a quantity thing, <laughs> which I found. Um, and then it's really how to explain the you know what what merit these names have to the client in a way that's 
you know, how, how does it help support the message they want to go to the market with? You know, the name is really just a, a tool at the end of the day. It's a marketing tool to help support their business and you know, support their positioning or their message um, and, and really act as that vessel, you know, into the marketplace. And that's a scary thing for uh, new businesses or people who are rebranding because it's, it's just new. And, you know, as humans, we were like hesitant when something's new. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine. So I think that's one of the key, um, really what you encounter is, is helping people imagine, imagine what the brand could become. You know, it's, it doesn't exist yet out there. It's not like you can point to it in a store and you, you have, you know, people point to a name like Apple and they love it, you know, for example, but imagine that Apple didn't exist. And then imagine you presented that as a name and people would be like, well, I don't, I don't get it. It's a fruit. What does that do? Um, but, you know, so it's like you really have to um, help them and, and really hold their hand like, and walk with them and, uh, you know, constantly reassuring like that, that ha explain it to them in ways that, that, that are helpful and how this name can support their building a brand, helping them imagine the brand that could be that could be built around the name, um, because, you know, at, at the end of the day, a name can only do so much. It's not going to do everything for the brand. It's not going to, I'm probably saying all of the talking points that you guys all say every day, but um, it's, 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 you know, part of the brand. It's not the entire brand. Right. And so really it is, there's the creative of coming up with a name, but then there's all of the, you know, the rationale behind it. How does it help? How, what, what is this going to do for them and their business? Um, and, and then also all of the just really tactical things like, is there an available trademark for it? It might be a great idea, but um, that you know that that's where the science sort of comes in. Um, and is it is it available? And then again, linguistics comes back in. Is it linguistically appropriate in other languages? Say, if it's a global trademark, um, is it appropriate culturally? Uh, and so all those things come together. And then and then yeah, it's the client management. Um, you know, really trying to walk with them in that process of creating a new brand or, or rebranding that uh, that there's a lot more to it than just writing names on a, on a page. Mm -hmm. and I, I personally hate the word brainstorming because I feel like it implies this sort yeah. of just shotgun approach, throwing stuff against the wall, mm -hmm. seeing what sticks, and that is not the way to do it. And, and one thing that I feel like my linguistics training really helped me with was understanding that naming is a process, right? Like anything that you would do in academics it's a process. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. If you don't follow the process, you're not going to succeed. And the process needs to be fairly regimented, and it needs to be specific. So I think the first thing that everybody in naming does, when you meet with a client to find out their name, you gather all this information about their what they're trying to do and what the benefit is to the customers and how this name, this product needs to stand out from the competition. And from that, you write a creative brief, which distills all that down to maybe four or five messages. And then perhaps some specifications like needs to be available as a trademark, needs to have the .com domain, needs to be six letters because it has to fit on something, some UI thing, or it used to be a bezel when people manufactured things. And you have to create to the brief. You can't just create anything because you like the way it sounds. It has to fit what's in that brief, which then has the advantage as you're showing them names later on, you go back to the brief and say, remember, we agreed on these messages. Here's how these names actually execute on all the messages that we came up with. You're talking to them about why these are the right names, not just because you like them. It's do they serve a strategic function and are they going to be the place where you can build your brand? And for me, that's all linguistics, like expressing that, talking about that, narrowing the brief, all of that stuff. It's all of my linguistic training coming into play there. Uh, I'd like to add something to what Laurel just said. The, um, uh, again, uh, uh, I, I, uh, what, what Eric and Laurel described is, is also my experience in terms of the, um, the uh, uh, creativity having, uh, taking, taking less, uh, uh, less, uh, a lesser portion of one's time than project management. Uh, what, what, what I would add to what's already been said is that in, um, in linguistics, if we're analyzing languages, 
we can't <clears throat> we can't analyze a language without data from that language. We learned that lesson very early. And as project managers and talking with clients, we also really can't be credible unless we have data. So actual cases that prove something or another. So when we're talking about the value of a particular name on a list of dozens or hundreds of, of names, um, one of the uh, useful things is to have knowledge of past naming, uh, ex uh, 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 naming experiences, not only our own, but what did, what did Apple do when it came out with uh, Macintosh or the iPod? What were the, the, what were the successful names? Uh, what were the problems that were raised with those names? I remember when, uh, when Lexicon developed Pentium, there was pushback because it just sounded so, I don't know, mechanical. I don't know exactly what to say. So um, uh, just lacking human qualities. It was just, it was a surprising, chips at that time were named things like 8088. So I guess Pentium was an advance uh, to some extent, but uh, to, know, to know case studies and know uh, what the first reaction was to a name, you know, the famous false story about Chevy Nova, uh, 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 you know, allegedly not succeeding because in, in, in Spanish speaking countries because it said Nova, which just you know, totally fabricated and in fact it wasn't unsuccessful. But just knowing, knowing lots about the history of past names and then applying those, those, uh, those historical lessons to the present project. That again is something that no client is gonna be aware of. The client at best will, will know uh, uh, what, what they read in the newspapers uh, half of which was probably false or exaggerated. And so uh, what if, uh, what if these, the, the skills that we pick up in graduate, in graduate school, uh, massing quantities of experiences, past experiences that we can learn from, that's something that can be very, very helpful in, in project management. Great. I'm looking at the chat. There's a couple of yeah. questions. Uh, one question here. This is interesting. Do you work with naming in all domains or is it better, easier to focus on a specific domain? I, I think, do you mean industry or uh, product names or company names? Because it, the answers are sort of similar. Um, one thing that happens to me, I, I'm curious if it happens to you guys as well. When clients come, they, they say, have you ever named one of these before? You know, <laughs> this chip, this brand of water, this whatever. And often the answer is no, but that doesn't mean I can't name yours because you don't have to have the specific experience for the specific name. The naming process is the same, regardless of whether it's a chip or bottled water or uh, you know a catheter or whatever, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you follow the process to come up with a good name. Um, my company has done naming in all sorts of industries. We've done startups, we've done big companies, Lexicon has done everything, right? Billion dollar brands. Um, and it's the same. So you don't need to have specific experience in a specific industry or area or type of thing that you're naming, I don't think, unless you guys disagree with that. I don't know. I, in, in my experience, I mean, the you don't really need, I mean, you, you need like a service level, I think, and you sort of gather that with client interaction, you, you start mm -hmm. to get to know their business a little bit, but not to the extent where you need, you know, in-depth, you know, background research. I mean, the, the naming process exists exactly like you said, it's the same, no matter what the industry is really. Um, and I wanted to also go back to, because this is relevant, one of the comments um, above that, which was about, do you sort of compare your name with the products that compete with, with the product you're naming. Um, and that's true there too. So that's one thing that you would, you would want to learn um, when you're working with a new project, a new client is what are the, what are their competitors named? You know, what are, what are the names in the, in the competitive set? 
uh, because that'll start to give you a sense of what what the white space is, what's what's not really um, out there already. And so uh, I would say you you don't really have to um, detach yourself from from names or or that inspiration. You know, you can always have great. It's it's great to have examples of names you're inspired by or or things that brand names out there that you think are great and and why and because then you can kind of start to um you know show how you know i can create something like this for you because i know why it works here and so there's that that credibility there um you definitely do want it you you mentioned do you um decontaminate or detach yourself of all names um there is a sense of that uh when uh this is a this is yet another point um of you don't want to be completely like married to one <laughs> one name um you want to sort of be a little bit ob objective you don't want to fall in love with that because or you don't want your clients to because uh of all the hurdles that may come up you know in the end that's why we typically will show a client a set of names we never really just show you know here's here's your one name but it'll be probably like 20 to 50 you know for a project something like that um so that then they can have a short list to choose from and then work those through all of those the process that that Laurel mentioned the steps you know trademark uh, and you know linguistic screening and so you do kind of want to step back a little bit don't don't get too um, attached to one name in particular but um, definitely to have names that you like and why uh, and then how they compete against the names that are out there uh, is really valuable skill to learn one of the hardest lessons I had to learn was that clients often don't choose the best name, in my opinion. You might present them with 10 names and I, of course, will have a favorite and they choose something else and that's fine. They're the client, they're allowed to do that. But you can't get upset about that. You can't get angry at them. They will choose what they choose. That's their prerogative as, as the client. And, and it's heartbreaking sometimes when you present a lot of great work and they will choose um, the most you know, inoffensive or, or lowest common denominator type name rather than one that's bold. But it's part of the business and, and you just get used to it. I wanted to address Alex's question really quickly here in the chat. There is a there are a couple companies that focus on pharmaceutical naming. Brand Institute is one of them. And the reason for that is that pharma naming is different because not only do the names have to clear trademark, there are a whole slew of other hurdles that those names need to clear. Um, from the FDA in order to be approved. And it, it's just gotten so difficult with pharma names to come up with things that are available that don't break the FDA rules. It's very, very specialized and difficult. And I, I did a couple of those early on. I would never do them again. I don't know how you all feel about that. Working on a brand for a CBD product, which comes with a whole extra set of <laughs> issues and in, 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 along with the FDA you know, the, the importance of it not conveying what it does um, and not making any claims. And then also just the, the restrictions of, of it having CBD in it. So that was, a, that was an interesting one to, to come up with a name for. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go back also up to Nicole's question about cross-cultural communication mm -hmm. um, and how does that play into naming clients from different backgrounds? That definitely comes up. I mean, it depends on what kind of projects you take on. Uh, last year, I worked on one for um, uh, client Marina Bay Sands. So if you know Las Vegas Sands Casino, they own a, another casino resort in Singapore and they were creating a new building on their property for ultra luxury where, where the high rollers would go. And it was interesting because they wanted the name of the building or of the, they wanted to create a new brand for that, just that building um, with its own name and, and visual identity and style. Uh, and they wanted the name to be from Chinese, like they wanted it to be a Chinese word. And uh, it was such an interesting project because, well, I don't speak Mandarin or Cantonese or anything. And uh, I was working with a team of Chinese linguists trying to come up with what the, the brief was very specific. It was <laughs> to come up with a, um, a word from Chinese from either culturally or, or linguistically, but then was also pronounceable by people who speak English and the client team were, were all English speakers, um, but the customers were all strictly Mandarin speakers. Um, and so it was, it was interesting. Um, but I thought I, what I liked about it was that we were, um, it was something new, you know, it was like, it was, a, it was an interesting challenge. Um, 
and really cool to see how there was sort of a movement. And I think this is the case in, in Asia now generally of moving away from like um, European and, and American uh, words, you know, English words as a, to express a sense of luxury over there and really owning the, uh, their heritage and culture. And um, so that was really cool to be a part of and, and definitely out of my comfort zone of <laughs> trying to present names to the client that were from that I don't even know if I was pronouncing right. Um, oh, yeah, he said, can I share the answer? Well, sadly, COVID struck right in the middle of our project. And so the project kind of winded down. I don't know if they're gonna if it's gonna spin back up, um, but it was a fun one. It, there were some I, I really liked some of the words that that the linguists came up with. So much rich layers of meaning uh, in in that language. So, yeah. uh, to add on to that a little bit, I, you mentioned something that I think is important for people to understand is that, uh, as I like to describe it, you know, marketing's big, branding is smaller, naming is like a tiny little piece of it. But then even within naming, there are very specific disciplines that we don't always cover. So doing transliteration or translation. There are firms that specifically do just that. And there are some that do it very specifically for Asian languages, for Chinese. There are some that do it for languages in Latin America or in Europe. And it's great to have experts that you can call on to help deal with these other aspects of how the name's gonna be rolled out. Not every name goes out into the world world as the name, especially in countries where there's a different writing system or in Asian countries. So somebody has to figure out how to take this name and transliterate it into the, the local language that's understood. And you really, really need experts for that. Um, often names aren't translated. Sometimes they are. It depends, again, on the company and what the product is. And there are people who specialize in that. Um, there are people who specialize in providing the supporting copy perhaps that goes on a website in France or Germany to explain what the name means. So that's another area like I would never do that. I want the people who are the experts to do that to make it as clear as possible. So there's all these little satellite businesses I think that go around naming and it's super fun to work with those people. Um, and of course, my company doesn't do any graphic design either. So at some point the name gets handed off to a designer to do a logo or a word mark or um, develop the colors that are going to go with it. And that's a whole other area of creativity that is uh, naming adjacent, but different people who do that, generally speaking. Um, let's see. Oh, so Emily points out we have a panel next Thursday about localization and translation, which is cool. And I would also like to put in a plug. I'm actually having a naming workshop tomorrow afternoon that goes over some of the ways in which you do this. It's a little, it's more nitty gritty than this conversation we're having now. I'm going to lead people through what a naming process is like. No trade secrets. It's the stuff that everybody knows. We all do it the same way. Uh, but it'll give some answers to like, how do you come up with things? Literally, how do you sit down with a list or, or a blank piece of paper or an open Word doc? Where do you start? So we'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, it's coming up on 10 o'clock. I wanna make sure that we get in all the questions that people have. So before we turn to the things in the chat, cause I see there's questions coming. Did any of you wanna get in some more points based on your experience or talk about maybe things that you're working on now that might be interesting? I'd, I'd like to say something about a topic that, that we haven't covered that might be of interest to some people, it's it's about the the difference differences between working for a company and working in academia. Um, uh, Stanford has uh, just a wonderful linguistics department. Uh, I've uh, 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 started out there in 1972. It's really uh, uh, know and love the place well, but one. One thing I noticed uh, almost as soon as I started consulting for Lexicon is that uh, because of the nature of the business, and this has come out in people's uh, uh, presentations and answers to questions today, <clears throat> there are many, many different facets to, to naming. And, in a, in a company at least the size of Lexicon. Lexicon's about the, the size of uh, average linguistics department. It's really not that, that different. There are probably 15 full-time people there. Uh, 
Um, you have uh, uh, different people doing different stages of the operation. And unless those people work closely together, everything breaks down. So teamwork is very, very important. More time goes probably by a factor of 20. More time goes into team building at Lexicon than it ever did uh, in Stanford linguistics. You really, uh, if you like playing on a team, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, one of the wonderful features of working in industry is that uh, you're, you're, you're uh, part of a team. Uh, the other thing that I uh, want to mention is that the um, uh, when in, in academia, when we're evaluated for a job, when, for, uh, when we apply for a position, what, uh, what are the criteria? Well, you, you come and give a job talk, so they evaluate your, your performance. You have um, a work that you've done. You have a CV and people look at that. And that's, that's just about all. In, in industry, it, it, it matters more, it seems to me, that other people may disagree, what kind of person you are as shown by your outside interests. So if you like rollerblading or swimming or jogging or whatever, that's actually relevant in, in, in some cases to whether you, uh, you'll be hired or not. You, uh, 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 if, if, if you're selecting someone, not just to do a job, but also to be a member of a team, someone who can understand other people, get along with them, contribute to them, support them, and so on. Personal qualities are just as important as what's on your CV. And, uh, and so that, that, can, uh, that can be a, a, a key factor in it, it's, uh, how you present yourself when you're applying for a job is probably quite different in industry than it is in, in academia, at least that's, that's my take on it. Yeah, I think that goes for individuals too. You know, connecting with clients is extremely important. Um, if they don't connect with you in some way, they won't trust you. Even if you bring all that academic experience, they want to know who you are as a person, that they can feel comfortable working with you. Yeah, the, the human relationship element. We actually just, we, we just lost a job actually due to, you know, we, we were positioned totally well to answer all of the client's needs. But at the, la at the end of it, um, it came down to, they had worked with another, or that they got a referral from an agency that they had worked with to another agency that that agency knew. And so mm -hmm. just based on that connection, um, you know, even though they, they really liked uh, our presentation, it was it came, I think it really just came down to, you know, they, they trust the word of, of the person they already know. And so that you can't really, you can't really beat that. Yeah, totally agree. I think um, we find that so much of our work is word of mouth, right? As you were just saying, people who have worked with us or know somebody who worked with us or had a good experience, they make the referral. There's still a lot of um, cold call business that comes in, but really it's that trusting the word of someone else that is responsible for a lot of the business that goes on. And that's all about networking. I mean, we've saying this over and over during the LCL is that your best chance of meeting someone or finding a job or making a connection is through networking as uncomfortable as that can be. Sometimes mm -hmm. you absolutely have to do it. It's incredible how emotional people get about it. I, I often say that a lot of the work that we do with clients, as you all were talking about, it's like therapy for them. It really is. It's like talk therapy where they have to talk about their emotions and the connections. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it even 
becomes therapy for the company that you're working with, right? These are people who maybe haven't talked about how they feel about the company or the name or the brand that it's representing. This might be the first time where they all get in a room together. It's like an intervention where they, they have to actually talk about their feelings. It's, it's not a thing that happens in business often where you can talk about feelings that you have and have it be heard and respected. Um, and that's part of the I think what we serve as is a good sounding board for that. Plus it helps us develop better names in the end. Um, here's a good question. How big is the naming industry? <laughs> what a good question. Um, thoughts on that? What do you guys think? There's, I mean, you could just look at the trade, the USPTO trademark database. <laughs> it's just, it just keeps growing, especially in the last year. Uh, it might be good just to talk about the, the landscape. Um, so there are big companies, I mean, big, big companies that are multidimensional, like Interbrand or Siegel Gale or Lippincott um, that do lots of different things. So they, Landor, they do naming, they do other brand strategy work, they do graphic design, they might do PR or advertising. So they have a division that's devoted to naming. And um, there are often spaces there, there's a good opportunities, they do internships, there's a lot of turnover because the work is very hard and a lot of hours that you put in, but excellent training. Then there are the more mid-sized companies, Lexicon is probably one of the bigger ones. My company is pretty small, we have six people that um, are very strong, there's a lot of them. The job opportunities don't come up as often because we're so small, we don't hire people often, Lexicon, it hires people on a fairly regular basis. We, we have two openings right now, I think. <laughs> yes, I, I looked no. on the website. So you, I put that in one of our Slack channels. So yes, you guys should go over there if you're interested. Um, and then there's loads of people who just do it on their own, who have either um, industry experience, they worked for a marketing company, they're coming out of academia with a, a really good specialty and have this, this knowledge. Um, so you can go different ways. There are, are different opportunities for you depending how you want to work or where you want to get your start. And yeah, everything needs a name. So there's never going to be a lack of work. There's a lot of work and there's a lot of naming companies and we all kind of peacefully coexist and there's enough, I, I perceive it as enough work to go around right now. Uh, let's see, here's another question. Any information you can share about salary ranges or compensation for naming projects? Uh, also a really good question. Um, hard to say. I think it varies quite a lot depending on where you're working and uh, who you're working with. At, at Lexicon, my experience with uh, linguists is the, the salaries are at about the level of academic salaries. If you, uh, if you come into the co company, uh, the, the salary is very close to beginning assistant professor, for example. The flexibility of who's the client. I mean, even at, at the agency level, we sort of adjust our, our fees accordingly and based on really the scope. Like, what do you, what are they, because there's, there's naming, but not all naming projects are equal, you know, in size or scope. And so, um, and as far as if we want to put specific numbers to it, entry level, if you're start, starting out as like, you know, on the account or creative team in the San Francisco area, you're probably uh, ballpark, maybe 45 to 65,000 a year, um, somewhere around there. And then, you know, it's just based on your skills, your experience, uh you know what the what the company you're working at is like and that that can all completely change and vary and and what town what city you, you live in exactly um for people who have a lot of experience <clears throat> who have been doing this for a while if you were going into um to work for a, a larger company um say you had 10 years of experience managing projects and doing creative your starting salary might be between 80 and 100k plus benefits. So it, it is entirely mm -hmm. parallel with what you've been doing and what your areas of expertise are. This is regardless of whether you have a PhD. Like you don't have to have a PhD in order to get that kind of salary. It's entirely dependent on what your experience yeah. has been and how successful you've been doing it. Um, to give people an idea of how projects are priced, typically 
it's a project basis. Like my company does it this way. I think Lexicon does it this way. We don't break it down hourly and bill the client hourly for it the way perhaps a lawyer would do it. It's more, let's look at the scope, how much work we're going to have to do, what's the screening involved, and we give them a number. There might be some line items added to it, but there is a big number, and that number could be 50K for a naming project. Could be less, could be 30K if it's less work, could be more. If it's a big multinational project, there's a lot of stakeholder interviews, could be 70K. Um, now, we don't get that <laughs> as employees. That goes to the company, and then your salary gets paid out of it. For individuals, it can be less. I know some folks who do naming projects for 10K, and that's some cre you know creative and then some screening that goes along with it. But individuals can certainly charge more than that. Again, if they have the experience, if they've got a good portfolio. Um, but it's a lot of work, right? When you're a one person show, it, to charge 10K for a project sounds like, wow, that's a big chunk of money. But when you think of how much work you actually put into it, it works out pretty well on an hourly for you basis and how much blood, sweat and tears actually go into it. Work, naming is hard. Like this is why people hire naming companies. It's not, as clients seem to think sometimes, people sitting around in a bar having a couple of beers and writing words on cocktail napkins. Maybe it was that way in the 50s. It is not that way anymore. It is a huge amount of work to find names that are appropriate for the client and available. Doing all this availability checking is a ton of work. And then you have to evaluate what's left after the screening to present to the client what is going to be the best name for them, given everything that you've learned. So hey, Marcus. there was a question that was posted in the chat a few minutes ago, asking for names of entry level positions for people that are interested in getting into the branding space. So are there any suggestions for that? Yeah. Um, so Will was saying that Lexicon actually has some job postings open and they have the word linguist in the title, which t actually seems a little unusual to me. Yeah. Typically, you don't see linguist in that. Um, what what do they say at salt eric what, what you would probably more likely see account manager or account executive or something with the word account um creative strategist those types of words are more often used than linguist lexicon really has a commitment to that linguistics rigor and so they'll mm -hmm. they'll they'll have linguists on staff who may or may not even do creative they probably do creative but mm -hmm. um but th that, that is its own role there. And I don't know if I've seen that in other, other agencies, um, but yeah, um, something with creative in there, account, manager, strategist. Uh, sometimes it'll just be naming, you know, naming specialist or something like that mm -hmm. at, at like a land or, or a Siegel and Gale type of agency. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's such a good point. I'd forgotten about that, but it's so true. Um, and those people, they might be in charge of branding, like, managing brands, um, they work with naming companies because they can't possibly handle it all themselves all the time. They will often reach out and put a company on retainer to handle all the naming that happens at that particular company. I know Cisco's done that in the past. Um, we work with PwC in New York. We're on retainer with them. Um, Wells Fargo does it. Lots and lots of big companies. And in those positions, you're not often developing you know, exciting product names that are customer facing, but there's a ton of work to be done, just naming things clearly and descriptively, either for the benefit of the people who work at the company or sometimes their customer facing things. Descriptive naming is also extremely hard, not coming up with cool, creative, fun names, but just the labels for things that people can understand and that differentiate them from other um, offerings that might exist even just internally. It, it's a whole other area. I like doing that because I'm not creative. So I like putting words in order, like little algebraic equations, word one, word two, and word three. How can we mix these up so that they express something real and convey a, a good idea to the consumer? Yeah, that's a great point about descriptive naming. That's that's a lot of what we do as well. And I find that harder than than trademark naming sometimes. I mean, really because then you you almost have to know the business even more because mm -hmm. you have to know what terms people use and what would make sense to to their customers or what would make sense internally in their in their company and so yeah don't, there's a lot of there's a huge opportunity in in b2b 
business to business descriptive naming um it can get a little dry sometimes but it's <laughs> there <laughs> yep and, and oh go ahead oh sorry i just saw the comment come in what is descriptive naming um oh. well so the, yeah there are different types of names right there's there's trademark brand names you know like apple google and, and then there's things like um you know what smartphone you know that's like a descriptive name for what this is um and so companies will have products or features or technologies that sometimes they don't want a trademark for they don't want to defend a trademark on or it's not really worth applying for a trademark for it's not that uh and so they just but they still need to put a term on it and so what do you call that and um and so that's that's often a, a really um you know, a really challenging exercise because you have to know, you know, what's, is there an industry industry standard term for what that is, what pr this product is. And, uh, and so sometimes that's, those are the projects that we, we get handed. Hey, Nancy, you have a question. I do. Well, it's not a question. It's a comment to add to this piece of the discussion. I was at Apple when the Newton products came out and I was part of that team. And the thing we got criticized for later by Steve, who was not there when this happened, that's Steve Jobs, in case some people don't know, um, was that we didn't name the category. So intelligent assistant or personal intelligent assistant was supposed to be uh, the name of that category. And we used it descriptively all over the place, but never trademarked it. And it, you know, it went out and somebody else, whether it was Handspring or uh, one of those other companies that was cr also creating small devices before the iPhones were available and the portable, the mobile phones that were not flip phones were available. So that was kind of a lost opportunity and why descriptive naming sometimes turns out to be really important. Mm -hmm. And everybody's wanted, rushing to be first to market, you know. <laughs> um, I also wanted to mention that naming comes into play in uh, UX stuff as well. I, I gave a talk at Baykai, Nancy's organization a couple of years ago that was talking about the verb that you use when you're using a device, right? When there's a button on here, what do you do when you do that? Are you pressing a button? Are you tapping it? Are you selecting it? What's the word that goes there? People use different words for that. And it, it's a very non-intuitive thing. Like some people think it's tap, some people think it's press or push or select, it, it, you know? Nancy, you're on mute. Yeah, they'd still extend the word click. Or click, right? Like you're not clicking your mouse because there's no mouse. It's your finger that you're using to do this. So somebody somewhere has to decide what gets used because it has to go in the documentation. It has to go in the instructions. It has to go perhaps in the marketing. If you are putting it out in an ad and you're saying how easy it is to use this thing, what's the verb that you use to describe what you're doing there? So that, that part of naming is um, partly linguistics based, but also research based, like Will was talking about earlier, that's something where you could go out and survey people and test different words with them to see which seems to make the most sense and maybe do it based on an actual bunch of data that you collect. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we are coming up to the end of the hour. We're actually a little bit over, but that's okay because nobody's using this <laughs> room right after us. So um, I wanted to say we're going to, well, I am anyway, and hopefully some of our panel can hop over to gather. We could continue the conversation for a little bit. Uh, I will be there for the next half hour or so. Um, there is a naming uh, workshop tomorrow that I'm holding. Uh, there's the translation transliteration thing that's happening next week. There's also a consulting panel that's happening later this week, which talks about what it is to be a consultant or a contractor as opposed to working in a firm. So if that's something that appeals to you, you might want to attend that as well. Okay, well, I think that's it. Thank you all for attending and thank you so much panelists for giving us your time. This was so interesting and I just love talking naming when namers get together, right? Like mm -hmm. it's fun to talk shop. Mm -hmm.